Hello, friends. Welcome back to another episode of Theology in the Raw. We got a few events coming up on the LGBTQ conversation. I will be in Plano, Texas, October 7th at the Revoice pre-conference uh, and also here in Boise. We're going to have a two-day conference on October 20th and 21st. Uh, it's called the Faith, Sexuality, and Gender Conference. Uh, you can come to Boise to be a part of that live or you can register to stream it online. All the information is at centerforfaith.com forward slash events. That's centerforfaith.com forward slash events. All the info is in the show notes. Also, if you would like to support the show, you can go to patreon.com forward slash theology in the raw. Support the show for as little as five bucks a month to get access to the theology in the raw community. I have on the show today my good friend Caleb Kaltenbach uh, back again. I think this is his third time on the show. He was on just a few months ago talking about the Equality Act. This time, Caleb and I talk about his uh, recently released book, Messy Truth, which is kind of a companion book to his uh, first book, Messy Grace, which is an out- absolutely outstanding book. So I hope you enjoy this conversation. We talk a lot about how to engage LGBTQ people, um, how to think through the tension of grace and truth, which Caleb says the tension is love. <laughs> love is a thing that brings together both grace and truth. So I think you're really going to enjoy this conversation. Let's welcome back to the show, the one and only Caleb Kaltenbach. All right. Hey, friends, I'm back here with my good friend, Caleb Kaltenbach, who has written uh, another awesome book. You might know Caleb by the book Messy Grace, or if you're a listener to the podcast, you might remember Caleb and I talked about the Equality Act a few months ago, which if you're interested in that conversation, would highly recommend it. I don't know the episode number, but I think we did that back in maybe February or March. Caleb, wasn't that it? Maybe four or five months ago. Um, But anyway, thanks for being back on the podcast to talk about your latest book, Messy Truth. Thanks for having me, man. Yeah. Love being here. So I'm going to assume people are aware of your book, Messy Grace. I, I mean, I'll just, I'm a huge fan. If you haven't read Messy Grace and you're interested in the sexuality conversation, which if you're a human living in 2021, you should be interested at the very least in the sexuality conversation. Um, Caleb's book, Messy Grace, is absolutely fantastic. So highly recommend it. It's not just informative. It's just hard to put down. I mean, your ability to share stories, your your just your wording, your rhetoric, and everything. It's just a really engaging book. But uh, that's messy grace, and you just came out with a book called Messy Truth. Can you what, let's begin by talking about what what are the differences? Like why why the need for messy truth? Like what what kind of void is this filling? I'm assuming there was something that you felt like you needed to say that you didn't say in Messy Grace. Um, so tell us how these two books kind of interact with each other. Yeah, so um, kind of the bottom line or the main point of Messy Grace is that obviously, like everybody says, that there is a tension that we feel between grace and truth. And I make the point that that tension that we feel between grace and truth is love, that love is the tension that we feel between grace and truth. And so I felt like uh, there's a lot of truth and grace in Messy Grace, uh, probably leaning more on the grace side. But then again, one of points I make in messy truth is that love your neighbor is just as much truth as uh, when Jesus says, don't, don't take revenge, don't kill, don't slap somebody upside the head, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I wrote messy grace where it's more about a person's individual relationships, their personal relationships with LGBTQ friends and family. And then I wrote messy truth um, because I felt like I was missing the community aspect of it. Um, yeah. I really, really was like, okay, I think people find and follow Jesus better in community, not in isolation. And yet there are so many churches that I work with, that you've worked with, I know, and, and leaders that you've talked to with really good, well-intentioned, well-meaning people mm-hmm. and leaders. But you know, that they're like, man, I, I don't want to go too far. And then like, what if we compromise our, our doctrine and so on and so forth? Um, and I was just motivated by the fact that I, I wanted to help uh, people have really good conversations, grow in their empathy and stay firm to their convictions. And because I think that that is a recipe for great community. And um, it, it's the book is really oriented towards helping people understand how to get their LGBTQ friends and family connected to a Christ-centered, redemptive community. Mm. And so I would say that's the difference. One's about personal relationships. The other one is about community. So so Messy Truth isn't like a, a sustained like theological defense of marriage and sexuality. It's more how can a church, how can an, well, 
how can an ecclesiological community or just a Christian community hold to a Christian view of sexuality and, and, and marriage and yet welcome and, and help people flourish who are attracted to the same sex? Would that be a, it's more, it's almost an ecclesiological book. Would that be accurate? I think that's accurate. And, and it's also written from the standpoint of uh, you personally as well. Um, how can you help others around you to grow in their empathy? How can you lead them? Um, how do you measure your credibility to see if you have the uh, character to be able to walk with somebody okay. uh, and not trip them up? Like the last third of the book is devoted to how do you have a difficult conversation without shaming people yeah. uh, where you can dialogue and share things and so on and so forth. So some of the book is more ecclesiological, uh, has more of an ecclesiological focus. Uh, and then some of the book has, again, uh, still an ecclesiological focus, but from the reader, their uh, perspective, how can I help them get plugged in and what can I do yeah. uh, to help set up that meeting between them and the Lord? Can, can you give us, let's just dive in then, like what, what are some, uh, and you can start wherever you want, the last third, first third, middle third, like what are some like main pieces of advice that you're going to, that you give that you find are kind of the big like the most significant ones, like if you could pick the top five pieces of advice you give in the book, what would those be? Well, um, I, I guess I, I should have an order, but in no particular order, and I'll start from the end. Yeah. Um, I talk about the difference between guides, guides and gatekeepers. Okay. Um, I took the idea of guide from John Bridges' book, Epic, but then also from Donald Miller's book, uh, uh, Story Brand. You know, and I didn't plagiarize, but I'm building upon it where I'm like, you know, a guide is more powerful than the hero and the hero arc and the hero narrative, right? Because the guide has been where the hero has been and the guide is, is helping them and, and the hero is supposed to be following like Obi-Wan Kenobi, Yoda, Luke, Mr. Miyagi, Daniel-san, Gandalf, yeah. and everybody else and so on and so forth. And so um, I, I try to encourage people to be guides because we have a lot of gatekeepers and you know, anytime somebody follows Jesus, you keep walking forward. You don't stop. Mm -hmm. But when you're a gatekeeper, you do stop and you just kind of hang there and you're not leading anybody. You're just kind of a stalwart right there. And so I encourage people to be guides. Uh, when it comes to conversations, one of the things that I really try to help people to think through is to be intentional. If you have to have a difficult conversation, you got to be intentional. Mm -hmm. That means if you know that you're going to have a conversation where you're going to, uh, you know, share what you believe or more importantly than that, share Jesus, like you got to think about things like how, how will this person hear it the best? What time of the day is better? Um, hmm. You know, what kind of words would trigger them? Um, what is the goal of the conversation? When they leave, what do I hope will happen? How do I want them uh, feeling when they leave? Um, so on and so forth. A lot of conversations, as you well know, do not go well when somebody wants to share what they believe or more importantly, share Jesus. It doesn't go well because people are not intentional. Hmm. Uh, and, and I think we serve a very intentional God hmm. that has a plan. I mean, Galatians, right? In the fullness of time, God sent his son. And so God does have a plan. So I think well-timed conversations are uh, incredibly important. Hmm. Um, and then... Uh, I'll, I'll just throw one more in because I'm talking too much, but um, I, I really spend uh, a lot of time about the idea of belongingness in the first century, uh, in the first century church, and the fact that uh, you had the church there in, in these different cities, but especially in Corinth, um, and you probably had a high percentage of unbelievers there, just with how much Paul talked about unbelievers, and even the the whole chapter where he talks about tongues and he says when the whole church gathers together don't speak in tongues if an unbeliever is in your midst will they not think you're out of your mind my whole aspect there is not to say that all lgbtq people are unbelievers not at all but i'm saying that if paul was asking the church to be that intentional with unbelievers how much more intentional should we be hmm. with the people of our day that's good that's good what are some and, and this might be for people who haven't read your first book um, or, or really engage this conversation in, in much depth. But what are some basic assumptions that straight, let's just say conservative Christians 
what, what are some basic things they should understand as they seek to be intentional with somebody who is same sex attracted, LGBTQ, um, Christian, non Christian, whatever, you know, like what are some basic big picture things that that straight conservative person, maybe a parent, maybe somebody who just has a friend that came out, whatever, what are some things they should try to understand as they seek to be intentional in, in relationship? It's a great question. Here's some things I would say. Number one, um, not uh, the, the vast majority of LGBTQ people are not extremists. They've never been to a rally. They've never been to a parade. They've never been to a bar or a club. They want to live their lives and be left alone. They're just as frustrated at the government and Nickelback as anybody else. Nickelback. And yeah, the band. We're all frustrated at Nickelback <laughs> anytime they produce a song. Anyway, so yeah, they don't like The Last Jedi either. I mean, they're, they're, they're people like that. They're average, everyday people. Um, you know, and some of them may be in same sex relationships, but uh, there, there are LGBTQ people in same sex relationships where that is not their main worldview. Huh. That is not their main identity. Um, so so we can't make assumptions and think that, well, if somebody comes out, that automatically means they're getting in a relationship. That automatically means this. That automatically means that they're now um, uh, an extremist on whatever side. And and that's just not true. Yeah. Uh, because there are, as you well know, gay people who are very, very ultra conservative Republicans as well. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of yeah. like there's no one mold. So, I mean, I'd say that's the first thing. The second thing, one of the things that I talk about in the book is that we have to understand, and I, I probably simplify it too much, but I'm trying to make it simple for people to understand. And I realize that there's a lot more depth in what I'm saying here, but that there are really three different types of people. Um, number one, there are people that have experience with LGBTQ. That would be people who are straight, uh, opposite sex attracted, um, you know, who uh, are not sexual minorities. Uh, you and me, and probably a majority of your listeners. And I don't say that to impugn. I'm just saying there's a reason why sexual minorities are called sexual minorities, because the vast majority mm -hmm. is uh, heteronormative right. um, of, of individuals. Um, so number two, there are people who relate uh, to LGBTQ. These are individuals where LGBTQ is not their main identity. It is not their main worldview. They might be celibate out of their theological convictions. They might have gender dysphoria and choose not to get uh, medical uh, assistance that would shift their identity in some way or another. Um, they, they might uh, end up going into a same-sex relationship, but they relate to LGBTQ because they don't see it as their main identity. And then there are people who identify as LGBTQ. And in the book, I say these are the individuals where uh, it, it takes the most intentionality um, when you talk about different aspects of, of sexuality and especially Jesus, because their whole identity is wrapped into LGBTQ in some way, shape or form, whether it's within the community, whether it's the work they do or whatever it is. Um, anytime you disagree with that, they see it as an attack on their identity. Mm -hmm. And so you got to understand where they're coming from. Um, and I try to make the argument that that's why. I think it's phenomenal to have your your main identity, your primary identity, be in the Lord Jesus Christ because he takes your identity and he protects it. Mm -hmm. It's safe with him. It allows you to be an ordinary person through whom which God can do extraordinary things. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, that that's kind of what I try to help people understand is that there are people that we do interact with who identify. And the reason why people get so mad, the reason why people say, if you don't agree with me, get out of my life, is because— You've stepped on their identity, and they feel like they have to protect it. And when you step on their identity, they take it personally, and they're like, you're attacking me. And we're thinking, what? Yeah. I, I didn't say anything about you. So, so what do you, when you say step on their identity, what, can you unpack that? Like, what is that? How do people do that? Because I would imagine there's a lot, of, a lot of times that happens unintentionally just by the words we use, our posture, our approach, what we say, don't say. Can you yeah, help us understand what that, what that could look like? I think you unintentionally step on somebody's identity when you are uh, talking with them, maybe about uh, life, about beliefs, about politics, and then you start sharing that, hey, I don't agree with uh, the concept of same-sex relationships. Mm -hmm. Theologically, I don't agree. Um, but I feel like people should have the right to do that because it's law. Um, because you said you don't agree, there are some people who will say, okay, so— you're shutting me down completely. 
Mm. This is the uh, this comprises a main part, you know, the main part of who I am, and you're shutting me down completely. Mm -hmm. um, you accidentally step on somebody's identity when somebody comes out to you, and you start trying to do things like instead of listening, what you should do, you start trying to do things like throwing Bible verses at them, having a biblical discussion in that moment, trying to get them counseling, um, hmm. uh, getting upset, making it about you. It's not about you. It's about them. It's about them. It's about you listening to them. Because when it comes down to it, um, one of the biggest you know points that I make in this book is that we are fighting for influence. Um, all throughout our society, there is a war of ideas going on. And especially with my kids and your kids, my kids are 14 and 12, and I know you have kids, and mm -hmm. I, I am well aware that there are so many different entities and people out there that are fighting for influence over my kids. Right. And same thing with friends and people in my congregation. And so I want to do whatever I can short of sinning to keep and build influence with someone. Because the more influence that I have, the more of a chance that – uh, when life hits the bottom of the barrel, I'm going to be one of the first calls or texts that they make. And and that's really what I'm shooting for is influence. That's a great phrase, fighting for influence. And that word, the word, you have to say fighting, not just, hey, we're, influ look, we're influential or whatever, but like there's competing voices of influence that are trying to nudge our way into people's lives. Um, and, and we need to be strategic in how to do that. That's that's a great phrase. Um, yeah. One of the things I say in the very beginning of the book, um, you know, I, I kind of give an example. Um, you know, I think that there are good reasons for people attending or not attending a same sex way. And a lot of it probably depends on who's getting married. And I'll just be completely honest and put my cards on the table. I don't like attending any wedding. I don't like heterosexual weddings. I don't like opposite or same sex weddings. They eat up the day. The food is usually pretty bad. You have to wear uncomfortable clothes and you have to deal with mother in laws. Um, so very rarely will you find me doing a wedding. If I know the person, I'll do it. But they probably heard me say this and they don't want me to and I don't blame them. You know, um, I would rather attend video conference to a wedding and then you're done. I mean, that, that's just me. That's but, pretty low right there, video conference. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So my whole, my whole thing is this. I have people that ask me, should I go to my son or my daughter or my friend's wedding, my nephew, my niece, my grandson, granddaughter's wedding? And I'll usually ask them two or three questions. I'll say, okay, if you did, if you did not go, would you lose influence with them? Mm. Yes. Okay. Second question. What would you do? to be able to keep and build influence in the life of your child, in the life of your grandchild, in the life of your niece or nephew, what would you give? How far would you go to be able to earn the right to be one of the first people they text or call when life hits the bottom of the barrel? Like for me, I'm going to charge the gates of hell with a squirt gun. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it's all about influence. I and, and you've got to listen. Sometimes people, you know, they'll start opening up to you um, when they start trusting you and they feel like you have influence. Like, for instance, you got to listen for phrases like, I never thought this would happen. Things aren't going well. I never thought they would leave. Why are they doing this? I've never been in this position before. Future seems so uncertain. And again, you don't look for those for opportunities to say, well, this is what I believe about sex. No, you're a creeper then. No, you listen for those opportunities to be able to share about Jesus hmm. and the hope that you have in him. Hmm. And so that's why I say influence matters. Yeah. The, the wedding thing, and to add to this, because some people could might say, yes, I want to have influence, but I'm not going to sacrifice my convictions. Namely, I'm not going to sin to do that. So that raises the other question. Is it a black and white like, or just, is it a sin <laughs> to attend a <clears throat> wedding of somebody who is not following the bible standard of what marriage is and there at the very least it's a gray area i mean it's like you can't you there's no verse in like leviticus or something or numbers tucked away that says thou shalt not attend a gay wedding or whatever um so we're 
once you acknowledge that it is, this is a gray area. If you're like just your conscience won't let you go, you're tormented. I mean, I would still ask the question: Is that the spirit or some presupposition yeah. you're holding on to? And that's something between you and God you got to sort out. But if it's not sin, then the influence question I think is all the more meaningful. I do too, and I think that's kind of a Romans fourteen issue a little bit too. Yeah, depending on how well you know the person. Um, I'd say that. I'd also say that, um, that, and there are sometimes when people ask me that question and their kids don't want them to go, they love their parents. So they love their friend, but mm. they're just like, I, I know we're not on the same page and I don't want to be upset. Yeah. So, you know, and they're not taking it personally, but if they actually went, that would cause an issue. Um, and, and I think you can go to a wedding and not, uh, celebrate the union, but you can support the person. You can right. say things like, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I'm glad to be with you. I'm in your corner. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm always here. I love you. Mm-hmm. That kind of a thing. Yeah. Um, and here's, and here's one last thing I'll say is that, um, dude, how, how many, how many weddings have people gone to where somebody's getting remarried? Cause I got divorced. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, I mean, I have all the respect in the world for uh, people that have to do hard jobs, even county clerks. But I still remember when that one lady and I'm not trying to make light of her. I'm just pointing this out. And this one lady said, you know, I cannot issue these marriage certificates for same sex weddings. And I immediately thought, how many certificates did she issue for unbiblical divorces? She kind of had no way of knowing, but still. And again, I'm not trying to shame people that are divorced and remarried. That's not my point. Yeah. But my point is, is I think we need to be a little bit more gracious. We don't need to lighten up on what Scripture says. Right. But when it comes to our engagement with people, yeah, I think we need to be a bit more gracious. Well, it's a consistency piece too, right? I mean, if somebody said, I have a personal policy that I only attend weddings that match God's designed for marriage so no remarriage after divorce or adultery or whatever um no believer unbeliever weddings i mean my gosh you how, how extensive is that prohibited in the scripture you know um if you have that policy i only go to celebrate two christians getting married with no pride like it's actually matches god's ultimate vision for what marriage is then i i could respect that i would still raise the influence question and and, and maybe push back a little bit but if somebody is perfectly consistent then I'm like, okay, I can appreciate the consistency. It's when people are very in- inconsistent, like what you're saying, is when it's like that. Just that's just like, why would you, do you make an accommodation for this and not this? Like that just doesn't. That just looks looks like your cat. Your it just yeah. It just you're standing up for your opinion more than taking a stand for God's word, quote right. unquote. Exactly. You're that's just using saying. God's word as an excuse. Right. Um, that's the way I look at it. Yeah. Um, one other thing, if I can throw this in here that I talk about in the book, and I'm sure you've seen this too, Preston, um, that there there are people that can have um, two different opinions on the same issue. Hmm. Like marriage is a perfect example. There are people who, I, like, you know, you see these polls where it says uh, support for same-sex marriage is higher than ever, uh, 60%, 70%, whatever. Hmm. Like. I have no doubt, but also you look at how the polls are written and the questions on the polls, uh, number one. Number two, I've never gotten one of these calls. Nobody ever calls me for anything, <laughs> nothing. Like, I never get any poll calls, and I don't want I don't want them either. I don't, but yeah. still. But, like, you think about it, and, and the more that I'm interacting with people around North America, and I'm sure you're the same, um, I have found that there are a lot of people that still hold – uh, more than what I thought, a theologically conservative view of marriage, even uh, in the young generation, but they have a different civil view on marriage. Like this is my right. theological view on it, but I think that because it's legal, somebody should have the right to do it. I don't know that I would ever recommend somebody doing this, but I don't think that it should be you know, illegal or whatever. But theologically, I don't agree right, with it right have you found any of that as you're yeah, interacting yeah. with people yeah, well and that that yeah absolutely i get that question quite a bit can we hold to a theological um you know uh, christian view of marriage and yet still and, and here's where the language gets tricky like support 
or tolerate or be okay with or vote for or vote against? Like what, what's, what is our participation? What is our posture toward um, our secular society? And, and that, that's a bigger question about the intersection between church and state and so on. And, uh, you know, on the one hand, I, the way I've, I've personally worked through it. Well, my, my answer to people's question is I think this is, I think there's some flexibility. I don't think there's one right answer to it. The way I think through it is I do think that God's um, design is good for all of creation. So I think it's best for people creating God's image to follow the creator's design for how he's wired creation. I think that's best. I agree. Um, I agree. And yet we are, on the other hand, we're exiles living in Babylon. So I don't, I don't expect Babylonians to have a Yahweh centered worldview. So like when the SCOTUS decision happened in 2015, I could on the one hand say, I don't think that's the best way to live in God's creation. And yet, I kind of yawned like, well, it's about time Babylon was consistent with Babylonian values. Like, why wouldn't they, you know, and not if, but when polyamorous marriages are solidified, because there's no logic that present prevents, prevents, you know, the, the, like why too? like, <laughs> there's no, if it's consensual, it doesn't hurt anybody. If that's the ethic we're going by, then uh, it's a, it's in the near future when polyamorous marriages will be, will be uh, sanitized. And I'll yawn again. I'll say, Thank you, Babylon, for being consistent. I don't think this is the best route to go. I don't think this is going to uh, contribute to human flourishing. But I'm also not surprised when Babylonians live out Babylonian values, you know. Yeah, isn't that what Paul says in 1 Corinthians uh, 5? Yeah. You know, why Why would you judge the world? Right. Um, and again, I don't think that he's affirming or validating no. anything that's happening in Corinth. Because, um, like, you know, you know this, the name Corinth— <laughs> literally means to fornicate, right? <laughs> In the original language, isn't that true? Uh, well, pornea is fornicate. Uh, cor- I don't know the or the derivation of Corinth, actually. But anyway, yeah. It, it, I, read it a, a, I read in a commentary the other day that huh. it was, and then I saw a retirement bus drive by that said Corinthian living. And I'm like, wow, <laughs> how about that? That's no, where I'm we're sure going that to send grandma. Village. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Not, not, not there. Yeah, not there. But you're right. It, it's like it's like it's like why would you? There there needs to be consistency. Yeah. Um, and I think there needs to be consistency. Um, you know, as much as we can within ourselves. But I think that that falls within our character. Yeah. And what I've found is people who try to balance that tension they feel between grace and truth will always fail. You you need to quit balancing it, and mm. you need to get used to feeling uncomfortable. Hmm. over and over and over again. Um, And we need to understand that part of the reason why the Pharisees hated Jesus was because he was gracious when they expected him to be truthful, and he was truthful when they expected him to be gracious. Hmm. And I think we should have consistency in our character, the way we treat people, Mm -hmm. but we do need to leave room for, uh, in what I call in the book, intentional ambiguity. Mm -hmm. We do have to make room for that and uh, allow people to work out their salvation with fear and trembling, and then also work out their views as well. Yeah, Caleb, what do you do? I'm, I'm getting this question a lot more recently with how polarized everything is. It, it, I, I would say in the past when, and I'm thinking in particular of like Christian parents who have an LGBT kid who is either not a Christian or is affirming. And in the past, it's like if the, if the parent was like kind and listening and, and just caring and, and just nice and agree to disagree, the relationship went typically from okay to good. Like it was, you know, um, but I'm seeing more and more in the last couple of years where if there isn't full affirmation of basically everything the person believes, whatever, then that relationship is deemed toxic. Like either you're all in or you're not in at all. Are, are you seeing an increase in that kind of polarized um those polarized kind of options and how do you counsel somebody? Cause I, this is the question I get is like, what do I do? My, my, you know, my 15 year old daughter says, if I don't hundred percent support her, you know, transition or her identity, or whatever, then I'm toxic. And I, I, she doesn't want me anywhere near her. How do I communicate? How do, how do I get over that? And I, I really don't know. I, I don't have a good answer for that. Cause that deals with a deep down 
kind of just worldview that's it's hard to overcome or at least i haven't found a good response i don't know if you've encountered that and if you have any words of wisdom on how people can navigate 100 percent, 100 percent. um it's difficult especially when we live in a society that overvalues feelings and reactions and undervalues logic and truth mm-hmm. um and we see that happening over and over and over again this us versus them mentality mm-hmm. um I have a friend who's writing a book on politics right now. Um, a Christian friend. It's going to come out probably sometime next year. Can you say who it is they or have, what it's about or not? No, I can't okay. say who it is. But there are a lot of illustrations in there about um, conservative um, uh, uh, extremists. And one of the points that I made was, you know, hey, I think that's all well, fun, and good. But here's the thing. Um, you need to include some examples of extremist progressives in there because especially this time next year midterms 2022 you're going to see more of that and i see a lot of progressive christians and just people who are in progressive politics in general they are repeating the same mistake that the christian coalition did in the moral majority of the 80s and 90s where they are putting so much of their investment into policy change and voting and elected officials and eventually they're going to crash. Eventually it's not going to go well. And the pendulum is going to swing the other way. But for right now, and this probably always been this way, it just feels this way right now, especially because the volume is turned up on emotions and reactions. And so I, I, I struggle with that because it's almost like we have to think about in the way that Paul does in first Corinthians nine, 19, um, I become all things to all people. You, you meet people where they're at. Sometimes that conversation doesn't go well with parents because the parents are trying to be logical and the kid that came out is very emotional. Two ships passing, come down here. Mm-hmm. But some of the times the kids are like this and it's like, if you do not, yeah. then. Yeah. And I think a couple of things in those situations. Um, number one, it's obviously subjective. And it depends on the situation. And you're right. There is a tremendous amount of complexity in there, especially when you look at the family as a system. Um, And so it needs to be weighted through very, very carefully. Um, Number two, I would say this. Um, uh, In in those moments, when people say things like that, the less you say, the better. The The less less you say, say the, the less you say, the better. Okay. The less you say, the better. Like, the more you say, I love you, the more you say, really? Okay. I, you know, I, I understand what I understand that you're very upset about this. Um, but you need to know that I love you no matter what, no matter what your feelings might be telling you right now about me. I love you. I would say the third thing to do is to ask questions, really good questions. Like, because, you know, when, especially when people are amped up, like questions, it, they engage another part of your mind. Um, they they kind of bring down your guard a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, I have found that when people are really mad at me, they're usually three or four questions away from telling me what's really going on in their mm-hmm. life, what they're really mad at. And I'm not saying that I didn't do something stupid or something to trigger it or something like that. But if they're really mad and their reaction is not matching the circumstance, there's something else going on. Mm-hmm. And so... Asking questions really, really helps. Okay. You know, like if a child says, hey, you know, if you don't agree with this part, you're toxic, you know, and you're treating me horribly and that's abusive and so on and so forth. Mm-hmm. I think one of the best questions a parent can ask, and again, you got to measure your credibility too, um, but I think the best question a parent can ask or even a friend, if you have a friend doing that to you, is to say, you know what, I'm really, really sorry that I made you feel this way. That was not my intention. Could you help me to understand in the past when I made you feel this way? Could you help me understand how I've done that, you know, in the past? Huh. Um, because funny. usually you haven't. And usually when somebody comes out to you, there's a fairly good chance you probably already knew or mm-hmm. were suspicious of it. Mm-hmm. Not always the case. Sometimes it's a surprise. But I I, there have been so many times when somebody has come out to me and they're like, this must be quite a shock to you. And I'm just listening. But in my head, I'm like, nope, <laughs> not a shock at all. Yeah. 
Um, you know, so I, I think that I think that drawing back on if you have a good relationship with that person, drawing back on on your relationship from the past, say, help me understand how I made you feel that way, you know, before. Hmm. And if I haven't, why do you think I'm all of a sudden shifting right now and making you feel this way right now? Hmm. You know, I've known this about you for a while. Hmm. Um, yeah. You know, uh, just questions like that. I have a whole section in the book on questions. I have like a chapter where I list like 80 questions that huh. groups and families and teams should be asking each other and that kind of thing. That's good. And like you said, it's the nature of the question too, because there's like interrogative questions or there's rhetorical questions, cornering questions, or there's genuine, like, you, you have to have all the way down to facial expressions and t your tone. You have to be, and it comes down to your heart too. You have to be genuinely hundred percent actually interested in this aspect of the person. And that's why you're asking the question, right? You're not trying to yeah. bend the conversation. You're not trying to make a point. You're not being Socratic. You're not trying to, you know, lead them to a place where they where contradictions and illogic or, or logic are exposed. You're trying to actually find out a certain aspect of the person because you are genuinely inquisitive and, and interested. And they can feel they can sense that, right? I mean, that's that's something any human, most humans, can just pick up right away what kind of question it is. That's why the second half of the book is devoted to empathy. That's How so do you build empathy with people? How do you lead people uh, to empathy? Because empathy <clears throat> I talk about how empathy is not rejecting somebody. It is not agreeing with their opinions. It is not signing off on their worldview. It's not approving of whatever relationship choice they may have made with somebody. Um, it is acknowledging their reality. Uh, it's going the extra mile. Like, I don't think you can walk a mile in somebody's shoes, but you can walk miles next to somebody. And that's what empathy is, where you walk miles next to somebody. And when something like that happens, hopefully you're to a point where you know them well enough, yeah. where you know how to be empathetic. And it, it really costs you nothing to acknowledge a person's reality or, as uh, Brene Brown says, to feel with another person in that moment. Um, and so I think that that um, you're absolutely right. And that's why questions in that moment, you're not in a courtroom, you're not a litigator, you know, mm -hmm. you're, you're not talking to the IRS, <laughs> nothing like that. They've got to be open-ended, turning upward questions, you know, where you're trying to not only um, get them to think deeper about your relationship. Yeah. If you actually want to have more of a conversation with them, you got to bring the emotion, the tension down. Right. You know, so they've got to be turning up. You know, what's the hardest for me. I'm just going to be totally honest and confess is, is when people have and this goes for whether you're super conservative super progressive whatever like airtight kind of you know um, echo chamber you, you want to live in like i just that is so unhealthy unrealistic dangerous it's not going to lead to happiness you cannot live in a free society and have that kind of view um i don't know if you saw that south park skit on safe spaces that came out a while ago <laughs> <laughs> have you seen that you gotta go no, not yet okay everybody needs to google that pretty soon uh south park safe space and it's it's just kind of a parody on 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 that kind of way of thinking there's a there's a halfway through the the evil villain comes out and you know this person's in her safe space padded walls and everybody loves me and then dun, 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 the evil guy comes out and he goes my name is reality you know <laughs> like <laughs> Um, I'm writing that down right now. Yo, no, no, no. You'll you'll watch it several times and hopefully you'll tweet it. It's I mean it's it's politically incorrect like South Park typically is, but um, and, and I and I don't like. There's people that have been through genuine like genuine trauma. Um, sure. They 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 where where certain words can truly trigger up some serious trauma. So I don't want to downplay people who have been through that. And yeah, um, but I think. I, I don't know if you've read uh, the coddling of the American mind, Jonathan Haidt, and uh, oh yeah, Fantastic so you read book. that book, and the, and then when you, you, it's almost like you want to download that message into the mind of everybody because you're you, you realize that this kind of hyper safetyism, where if you're around people that disagree with you, it's like you, the people don't know how to handle that. Like that is a very unhealthy, unhappy way to live. So. All that to say, when I encounter this kind of polarized posture where people are like, I can't 
be around people that disagree with anything about what I'm doing. It's like, it's just kind of, it's, it, 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 it both triggers like frustration and also sadness in me. Cause I'm like, man, it's, I'm frustrated that can't you see why this is not a good way to live. And also sadness of like, this is not your, it's gonna, it almost always leads to all kinds of anxiety, depression, suicidality, and other things, because that's not reality. Like South Park says, you know, you can't, right. unless you just lock yourself up in your room or just, you know, cause the second you get a tweet or an Instagram or somebody doesn't like your post or whatever, you just, you can't function. And like, that's not, we're becoming so fragile. Um, and that's just not a healthy way to live, but no, no, it's not. And it, it's, it's really pride when you think about it. Um, you know, there's all, there's pride where you think you're just the best thing in the world. Then there's pride where you think the worst of yourself mm -hmm. or you really try to protect yourself so much that you won't engage and interact with other people. And God didn't make you and create you to be an island to yourself. Mm -hmm. And again, you and I both would affirm that for some people, there are some really, really honestly abusive or toxic people in their life. And there needs to be a lot of distance. And right. in some cases, the relationship needs to be shut off, um, depending on the abuse or the toxicity or that kind of thing. But those are few and far between compared to what we're talking about, mm -hmm. you know, for our for our whole manner. And that's why I love Jonathan Haidt and just what he says. And I think he drives both conservatives and liberals, especially liberals, nuts because mm -hmm. um, he still teaches at New York University. And he's the one, I think, in that same book who said um, that – we don't need to disagree better as a society. We need to learn how to disagree. Uh, sorry, we don't need to disagree less. We need to disagree better yeah. um, as a society. I remember he wrote that in the calling of the American mind. We don't need to disagree less. Like what everybody's saying, let's just disagree less. He's like, no, we need to learn how to disagree better because if you disagree less, you eliminate dialogue. Right. Right. Yeah. And that's when it comes back to the person who, wants to eliminate anybody in their life that disagrees with some aspect of how they're living, their identity, whatever. Um, it's just not, ah, it's just, it's, 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 I, I know parents are just can be so frustrated because they're like, I can't like, how, how can you place those kind of demands on all relationships in your life? Like it's, just, it's not healthy or realistic and man. Um, it, eventually you're going to crash. And again, it goes back to influence. Yeah. When somebody crashes, somebody somebody who's acting like that will eventually hit the bottom of the barrel. Something will happen. It will rock their world completely. And when that happens, I hope to have enough influence to be there for that person. Yeah. Where they see yeah. me as a person to turn to. And that's when you can really leverage your influence for the sake of Jesus. Is that helpful to say? Like if you're in that moment with a with a kid, and it's not just a kid. I mean, we keep using parent kid examples. It could be a friend. Um, if, if they're drawing that line and like you said, speak less, listen more, ask questions. If you do speak, do you, do you find it to be helpful to even tell, to almost plant that seed ahead of time saying, Hey, look, I totally want to respect your space. I, I would love, love to be in relationship with you. But if that's not something you want, I, I want to respect that. But I want you to know that if, 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 if you ever do want to revisit this relationship, I will, I would love to come back into your life. And if you ever need anything, I I'm, call me any time of the day, night, whatever. And I, I will be there for you. Is, is that, do you think that could be helpful to kind of plant that seed? So not if, but when they do kind of crash, they know, I think this person's. Yeah, it's the same. Yeah. And I think that works better with friends than with kids. Okay. Like that would be hard for me to tell my kids, Hey, if you want out of my life, yeah. then. Just go ahead. I mean, right. and I'm not saying that there are times when you shouldn't say that, but I think that should be the last option. But I know what you're saying. You're saying, especially with friends, I kind of like there's a there's a I mean, you've been an elder in a church before you've been a church leader. So you understand what I'm getting ready to say. Um, and especially having lived in Southern California, you get this that I don't know how it is in Boise where you're at. But um, out here, if you remember, church hopping is a sport. <laughs> like it should be an Olympic sport, you know, in 2024 or whenever the next summer Olympics are, because people hop from church to church, to church, to church, to church all the time. And I found that as a pastor, if, uh, 
it's always the people that you seem to like the most some of the times that leave. And or somebody wants to be buddy buddy and they end up taking off. Yeah. I have found that if you just let people leave, it is easier for them to come back to church if mm-hmm. they want to. If somebody is backing off on a relationship and I address it and I'm like, I want to make sure I didn't do anything. And they're like, no, um, the worst things that I have done in my life is to try to get people to stay Hmm. in my life because there are certain types of people in our life. There are lifelong friends and seasonal friends. You get in a big trouble when you try to make a seasonal friend into a lifelong friend. And if somebody wants to walk out of your life, let them go Hmm. because again, if they come back, they're going to remember how gracious you were when they left, and they're like, he's going to be the same. I think that's why the prodigal son felt comfortable to return. He saw how gracious his father was to him when he left. Mm-hmm. If his father had been harsh, do you think the prodigal son would be raring to run back to him? Maybe, but probably not. Yeah. But he probably remembered the grace that the father had when he left. Mm-hmm. That's so good. Yeah, the father let him leave. He- Cause you can't force, you can't force a genuine relationship by definition. It's, it's a two way street, right? I mean, it's two, two people wanting to be in a relationship. There could be tension, disagreement arguments, but there has to be some kind of desire on both ends to want to be in a relationship. Um, it is, yeah, like you said, I, I'm, can't, I'm, I can't control them. Right. I can control right. me. I can't control them. The, uh, well, to kind of shift gears a little bit, th- this is the hard thing that I've had when it comes to when they would just community in general. Because I'll hear, I just heard it the other day, somebody say, you know, you need to find community, you know, get involved, get a community, you know, and, and, and I 100% agree with that on paper, but what does that mean to find community that by definition, that community must also reciprocate? <laughs> like yes. I, I want, I, I long for this kind of, you know, book of Acts first century church, brother, sisterhood kind of community. Um, But I haven't always found it, even though I desire it because somebody else has to want it too. And they have to want me to be part of that community and be able to live that out in the way that it's intended, you know? Um, And if, yeah, I don't know. That's a kind of a... But don't you think that's also, and I'm not making an excuse, Preston, but don't you think that's also sometimes hard to find in Western culture? Yeah. As yeah. opposed to Near Eastern culture, yeah. you know, as opposed to um, just the trends and um, the values and uh, that kind of thing that you have in the Middle East, the Near East, as compared to the United States. Yeah. You know, I mean, you go to my wife spent a semester in Spain when she was uh, at school at Westmont and she was shocked at, I mean, not shocked anymore, but as a college student, how many people kissed each other on the cheek mm-hmm. over and over and over again. And like personal space is not a big issue, mm-hmm. apparently. Mm-hmm. I'm sure it is right now. <laughs> it's a big issue anywhere. But in, in regular years, it isn't. But then you come over here, you sit too close to somebody, they're like, yeah, dude, you know, so um, again, I'm not making an excuse, but I, I long for that too. Um, and I feel, and I've always felt like, there's a fine line between finding true community like what we see in Acts 2 and a cult, (laughs) you know, (laughs) where you do everything together, you know, and it's just like, you. I mean, if they ever say, Preston, come live in the dormitory, I think you should get (laughs) Come live in this compound. We have barbed wire. Yeah. yeah, Here's some white tennis shoes. Yeah. (laughs) I I would, I would pull the eject cord. (laughs) No, that's true. And I don't, I don't know. I mean, I know this is not more of an ecclesiological conversation, but that that's pushing against the tide of Western culture. How do you, you can tweak it, you can manipulate it, you can try to get around it, but it's, it's, there's that rubber band effect that people are going to me included. Like I, I I'm, I'm part of Western culture. Like that's how I was raised. I can't, separate that from me even though i long for something kind of different it's just so embedded into everything we do and even our church structures reflect that too you know i mean it's it's just it's hard Uh, Uh, absolutely during during the pandemic whenever when there are certain people who remain nameless because we probably know them but uh we both know them but there are certain people um who would say yeah i think big church gatherings are 
probably going to be a thing of the past. Hmm. Oh, I think the mega church, you know, it's not going to happen anymore. I'm like, you are a crack smoker. Yeah. <laughs> that is just not going to happen whatsoever. First of all, um, welcome to North America. Like, we love big events. That's why we go to movie theaters. Second of all, let's go over to Rome, right? Let's go 200s, 300s, 400s, gladiator games, Colosseum, so on and so forth. They even like big crowds back then. Yeah. Even after the Spanish flu, they start gathering again. I'm not saying the pandemic won't have an effect on how um, some you know, crowds are handled and that kind of thing, yeah. but it, it's hard to go against the grain of Western culture, of yeah. whatever culture you're in. It, yeah. it just When you said that, that kind of clicked for me, and I was like, yeah, you're right. It, it's difficult. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. I mean, this is why, you know, I, I'm, I'm sympathetic to Francis Chan and others who, you know, kind of say, I think we need to go strip this thing down to the very foundations and rebuild it because there's so many things in, in the way we do church that do reflect and foster kind of this Western individualism that it's hard to kind of like, you know, and. I agree. And I'm not, and I'm not making fun or just, and I know you know this, but I want to say this for the benefit of anybody listening or watching. I, when I, when I said crack smoker, I'm not making fun of, uh, or or trying to say, well, you know, if you're in a small church or this kind of a church or that kind of a church, then you're not in a real church. Um, I was just making the point that big crowds are not going away. Um, probably like, probably like you, I celebrate churches of all sizes. I do. I Um, really do. Yeah. And I think some of the times mega churches can get picked on pretty easily because they're a big target. But I know some really healthy mega churches, and I know some really toxic small churches. Yep. That's exactly what I was going to say. I, I've been in small churches that, I mean, you can be there for a while, and there's no real genuine community. Like people show up, smile. It's easier to kind of have superficial talk, you know, conversations with each other. But if they're easier not longing for the same kingdom. thing we're longing for, you can maintain superficiality. I mean, there's families I, I know that obviously live together with families, you know, and then like, Hey, so tell me about your conversations. And like, they don't talk about a lot of things. A lot of things are off limits that are just below the surface of, you know, so just, just being in a small gathering doesn't in and of itself guarantee in depth, authentic relationships. It it typically is probably easier to get there, but it can't guarantee it. And yeah, mega there's mega churches where people feel way more plugged in because of, certain struck, you know, certain things that the mega church has done to kind of foster that. But, um, yeah, it's hard, but at the end of the day, whatever the size, it's the gathering, it's, it's, we're all part of the same thing called Western culture that just wars yeah. against that kind of thing, you know? And ultimately we have to remember it's about his glory. Yeah. Um, not about my preference. Right. Um, you know, so yeah, that, that's where I think, this whole idea of community is so important. Mm -hmm. And I love how you said, you know, people go out and find community. Well, I think community should go out and find people. I mean, (laughs) people say that, ah, you come find community. Okay. Well, people already have that. Yeah. People have Starbucks. People have families. People have maybe good relationships in their neighborhood. People have good relationships. Um, even on social media with people, Mm -hmm. I mean, just whatever, what, kind of community can the local church offer that other places can't yeah like that's a question they should be asking and don't treat people like they're like wanderers in the desert like Mm -hmm. you have no community but you're here uh no dude i have a lot of friends they're not christian but i have a lot of friends so anyway hey before we close let's go back to your book real quick are there is there anything in the book that you would love to uh highlight piece of advice a story something they're like man if you read this book messy truth what are some big takeaways you'd love people to walk away with something that we haven't talked about already yeah um in the very first chapter i talk about uh and this has happened seven times since i've been consulting with churches i talk about a church i was consulting with very first time where they had two married lesbian couples Mm -hmm. Uh, both couples were middle-aged or upper middle age, they had adopted young kids from the foster system. They started attending their church, even though that they knew that the church was, uh, for lack of a better phrase, compassionately non-affirming. And about nine months or so after they were attending, they talked to a staff member and they said, we're married and we love each other, but we now believe that marriage is between a man and a woman. What should we do? 
you know, and um, even though some people might automatically think they know the answer in their head, it's not simple because right. you're dealing with people's emotions. Um, I tell uh, about a time, another time when kind of similar thing happened, except it was one couple, a uh, younger middle-aged um, couple and, um, you know, they asked the same question, but if they got divorced, one of them would lose her health insurance and she had schizophrenia. Hmm. Hmm. What, what do you do in these situations? And I think these situations are fantastic opportunities for the church com to come and walk miles next to people and for the church to be that community that can enter with that person or those individuals in the midst of that obstacle. Hmm. And we can show them that, hey, we've all been somewhere before and we're here with you right now. So, so you're not going to give the answer of what, what you said? Or is, is that besi that's besides the point? It's, it's here's an opportunity to... <laughs> Got to buy the book, man. Go buy the book. <laughs> I, I remember. I, I, I'm, I'm. I mean, I read that section. I'm now blanking on what you actually did say. So I'm. I got to go back and check it out. But yeah. Um, I don't, so I don't get till the end of the the end of the the last chapter. I I kind of resolve it. Yeah. Well, Caleb, the book is uh, uh, Messy Truth. If you have not yet read Messy Grace, I would recommend reading Messy Grace first and then Messy Truth. Although it is a standalone book. I mean, when I was reading Messy Truth. You're obviously referring back to your book, but it, people could just read Messy Truth and get a lot out of it. I'd recommend reading both. Um, uh, where can we, people we find actually, yeah. we actually wrote our books the same year, People to Be Loved and I know. Messy Grace. And I remember I read yours, you read mine. We're like, why don't we just write it together? I know. <laughs> well, and we wrote it. They, I think yours came out like two two months before mine, which means right. we were basically turning in the manuscript around the same time, and we didn't consult each other, but there were phrases – in our books, they were almost identical, which we it was impossible for us to plagiarize one or the other. Um, I mean, you would almost think it was the Holy Spirit, right? Something like that. <laughs> Moving <yeah>. there. <laughs> Moving there. But um, no, if people, uh, if people want to find the book, uh, they can go to my website, calebcoltonbach.com, um, and you can look for Messy Truth under Resources. Click on that. It's also on Amazon, Target, Lifeway. Okay. Just Mardell's, just all the usual suspects, um, audiobook, audible, ebook, paperback, all that kind of stuff. And you, so, do, you do church consulting, right? I mean, if if it, if somebody a, pa a pastor is listening and they want you to come out and help them work through a maybe a specific question or issue, even even you've done stuff that like legal stuff, right? Not as a lawyer, mm -hmm. but like giving advice on how to navigate nonprofit with legal stuff or. Yeah, with uh, some Christian colleges and seminaries. Um, and then also I met with uh, some denominational boards and um, then with a lot of churches. And then even with churches, like it can be a resolution over these matters to family, parents, marriage, all that kind of stuff. There's one church I was working with um, where their local city council passed uh, some laws that went into effect in the city that were very similar to the Equality Act. Oh, wow. And this is a multi, multi-site campus, so we had to think through, okay, what does it look like for there to be continuity with campuses? What can we do? What can we not? Uh, sometimes it helps uh, to have an outside perspective. Yeah, um, absolutely. But you, you've, done, you've done similar things as well, so... Yeah. Well, thanks so much for being on Theology Raw, Caleb. Hope your book does well.